some people at, uh, in my team, I saw them experimenting with yield farming, for example. And so they just put some ETH on a wallet and uh, they're like, yeah, I'm, all, I'm earning a euro per, uh, <laughs> per hour or I see it moving up per, per second. Like I'm, I'm earning money for my money being there uh, and it's an exaggerated uh, interest rate, let's say. And then two days later, it's like, ah, shit, uh, <laughs> it's, it went nine, minus 90%. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the name of the game in these things. So yeah, if you want to speculate today, I think that's where you have to be. Otherwise, stick with Bitcoin and a couple of ones you know have intrinsic value because the problem is with these projects is mostly which ones are now the ones that actually have merits to invest in. And that's very difficult to, uh, to gauge if you are not in it all, all, all day long, basically. Do me a favor, picture your favorite crypto app or exchange. Got it? Now I have five questions for you. Question number one, does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees? Question number two, does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms? Question number three, does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates, best liquidity, but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book? Question number four, is your favorite app or exchange Swiss made, but also licensed and regulated in the EU so that you can feel 100% reassured, but also sleep well at night? Question number five, is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values, 100% community centric and not VC backed? So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the Swissborg Wealth app, join the new era of wealth management and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind blowing guest, Ruben Mir, CEO of Engrave, a cool dude, but also someone who's innovating the space in terms of hard wallets, tons of cool topics that we'll discuss. So don't forget to stay until the very end. Before we kick off, a shout out to Emil from the Capitol and of course our friends at Theta TV for sharing this content and helping us accelerate mass adoption through educational stuff. So without further ado, Ruben, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? Thank you. That was a very energetic introduction. Um, very happy about it and I'm very happy to be here. So uh, let's get things going. Yeah, thank you so much. Everyone says that I'm overly energetic, but I'm just trying to make people happy on YouTube. <laughs> you are, you are, you are. I'm, I'm extremely happy today. Thank you. Awesome, Ruben. So uh, we were just talking about one of your very first investments in stocks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And you were very, very young. Great story. Great twist. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing that to kick off, that would be great. Yeah, sure. But I think like my really first investment, uh, so to speak, was when I was like maybe six or seven years old. Um, that sounds strange, but, uh, so I was on a boy scout camp. My, 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 my parents gave me like a little bit of pocket money. And what I did was I went to the vending machine. I bought as much as I could. Um, and then I started my own little hustle business, let's say. Um, and I sold it to my, my friends for, for a profit. <laughs> and, um, basically I came home with double around the double the amount that my parents gave me. And they were like a bit shocked, uh, what, what happened? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was my first investment and, uh, two X on that. So not bad, but, um, I think what might re uh, resonate more with the audience is, um, that in my, when I did my first equity investment and the reason is because. I was very risk adverse uh, back then because obviously um, I didn't know anything about investing. And what I, I remember that I just, let's say, did the, the buy eh, of, the, of the stock I bought and I was already minus 1%. So I just saw I bought something, I'm in the red. And 1% is a lot if you think about savings accounts these days. Eh? So 
it felt it felt bad. And over the years, I evolved towards uh, um, basically aggressive, uh, aggressively investing. So I remember that I had um, bought uh, another stock and uh, it was at some point minus 80 percent. And I, I really I still believed like hugely in the project. So I actually added to my position. Obviously, you can imagine that at some points in time, it feels it feels really cringy in your stomach when you do something like that. Um, but so I actually got up to a moment that I had a huge appetite for taking risk. Um, obviously, um, calculated risk, because, for example, also that project, eventually it gave me like a 5x, uh, even though I came from uh, at some point minus 80 percent. And then you think like I will never get my money back. Um, so, yeah, I really had that evolution and I was only in the stock market. And then obviously crypto came and crypto has its own uh, completely crazy ecosystem of prices that go up and down uh, in a month, what the stock market maybe does in a year or more. So, yeah, I mean, that's also how I got hooked to crypto in the beginning. That makes a lot of sense and a great story. And I think we see eye to eye on this because personally myself, I used to have some stocks. But to be honest, between us, I deleted all my apps, sold all my stocks and just went all in crypto and diversified within the crypto space. <laughs> Some people might call me crazy because they think you need to diversify no. and never have all eggs in one basket. How do you feel about that, Ruben? Because for me, the crypto asset space is not as risky as others may believe, you know, if you know well, if you do yeah. your due diligence. Yeah, for sure. So I think that everything, every kind of investment you ever uh, reflect on, it always comes down to a risk reward ratio, right? Exactly. And I think like, if we look at purely the stock market, um, I've been scared for the last few years when I looked at it. And the reason is because we're posting these new all-time highs. Uh, at some point, the, let's say the, the connection with the actual economy or the actual world is completely starting to vague, uh, become vaguer and vaguer. And um, we have these stimulus programs that are so huge that are basically inflating the stock market to bubble behavior. And uh, if, if effectively, that is something that many different writers about quantitative easing, which is like the, the buying of assets uh, by um, the central bank yeah, to basically inject money into the economy, that doing that action really pushes stock markets up. And you can just say, look at the graph where you have the, the quantitative easing or stimulus spending is going on and compare that to the graph of the stock market and you see a beautiful, um, a very high correlation between the two. And as you know, in 2020, uh, we had a $6 trillion stimulus uh, injection by the U.S. government alone, uh, which is as much as all the other programs they did before combined. Um, so that is really going to be interesting to see how that evolves in towards let's say, inflationary um, um, forces and so on. So I would say the stock market today, it's actually in terms of risk rewards, it's not very interesting to invest in that. And if you think about that, that means that there needs to be something else you look at, which is, for example, gold. And we've seen that gold also went up a lot in the last year. But uh, people are always talking about gold is a very inflation resistant kind of asset. Uh, but if, if you look in the last 10 years, uh, gold was in a bear market. So imagine you invested in 10 years ago in gold, you would bar barely have made a return at all. And if we zoom out and we look from, let's say, the 70s until today, you actually see a huge a long-term upward trend. But for me, gold is not really as convincing as it could be. And that indeed brings you to crypto. So crypto is a market that is still in, um, in trying to get out of bear market in recovery mode. And so we are at 50% off the all-time high of Bitcoin, more or less. So if you think about the risk rewards and about how small that market is, and obviously all the things you can list up as reasons, um, I think the crypto space is one of the most compelling when it comes to uh, risk reward ratio. And as you say, if you're over um, exposed to crypto, so am I. I think it's one of the best places to put your money today. Very well put. You know, we had Nicholas Merton, Data Dash, who said the same thing. It's all about markets of scale. How far can your investment scale and what are the asymmetrical yep. return assets? And for those reasons, you know, crypto space is very appealing. And just like you said, you know, the stock market to me was a bigger bubble than the crypto bubble, than the DeFi bubble. It's all fake money being injected into the system, right? Through, you know, the yeah. QE and people just buying back stocks, buying back bonds. It was highly inflated. So thank you so much for sharing that. It's so true. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of actually inflation, and we we're talking about all this money going to, into the, the stock market, a lot of people are worried about not just inflation, but hyperinflation. 
And yeah. I know, yeah. and I know, Ruben, you have great passion for Venezuela and some of the South American continents and countries. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more why it matters so much to you in terms of crypto adoption and why these are the countries that you would like to really help the most? Yeah, sure. So for me, I have a sort of an innate uh, uh, love for Spanish. And so that meant that I, at some point in my life, I lived in Spain, then I lived in Mexico. So I've been doing a lot of things with, with the language of Spanish and with Hispanic people uh, for some time. And um, yeah, indeed, if you look, for example, at Venezuela, and I don't know if you've ever heard about the Café con Leche Index, for example. Ever, uh, doesn't ring a bell? The Misery Index, ever heard about that? <laughs> Misery Index, yes. Yeah, so uh, the history there is a bit like in 2014, Venezuela's inflation rate hit like 69% and it became the highest in the world. So in one year, completely nuts. Um, and if you think that's nuts, well, the following years, the company, uh, sorry, the country kept on shattering records with uh, that hyperinflation uh, soaring to even 1 million or 1.7 million percent in 2018. And that's when the Bank of Venezuela said, like, OK, we are no longer publishing official inflation rates. Uh, and Bloomberg reacted on that, saying, yeah, but uh, um, maybe that means how can we know what the inflation rates are now? So they decided to build their own uh, index which was very simple. They just track the price of un café con leche, which is the price of one coffee with uh, milk yeah, in uh, Venezuela. And so that's that's basically how they now track the inflation right there. And um, so if we talk about the misery index, that is an index that was invented a couple of years ago where you plot companies, uh, sorry, countries um, with inflation on one side and um, an employment rate on the other side. And so what's interesting there is that the U.S. has actually uh, jumped 25 spots and it's now on number 25. And so the higher you are, the, the worse your economy. The reason there is because obviously uh, there is a lot of unemployment going on with COVID and so on. But the top five countries are number one, Venezuela, eh? um, number two, Argentina. Then we have South Africa, Turkey and Colombia. So three countries of um, um, of the of the Latin American uh, markets. And these are all really tortured or tormented by hyperinflation. And so exactly what they're doing is they're looking for ways to um, to pre preserve their wealth and to find a store of value. And then in, indeed, we come back to the same discussion, like, do we invest in gold? Do we invest in stock markets? Do we invest in real estate or do we invest in crypto? And as it turns out, and for example, Chainalysis uh, posts a lot of updates on things like that. They, they actually found that there is indeed a big relation with these countries, and especially even Venezuela, that I think they take as an example, that um, they are, are forming um, increasingly large appetite for investing in crypto and Bitcoin in specific. Mm, yeah, that's, that's so true. It's so interesting because actually speaking of uh, inflation, you're talking about even in the US, like losing spots in terms of showing a weak side of the economy. Dan Held from Kraken posted something the other day about the prices at McDonald's in the 70s. Yeah. And a Coke was 15 cents. A Big Mac was only 65 cents. So even in the US, you know, we're, we're struggling. But I yeah. think you have a great point there, Ruben, because, you know, in Western countries, 3% is kind of a danger zone. But in countries like you know, in South America or in the Middle East, in Iran, we're talking about 25%. Uh, every yeah. year in average. So it's it's really, really bad. And so is that the reason? How, how do you think we could help that? Are, I know that you believe stable coins is one way to solve this problem of the local people having to go to the supermarket with a suitcase of of bills, right? Just to buy their food and stuff like that. Is this is the stable coin the most effective way to solve this? Yeah, I think uh, obviously one part is it comes down to finding safe haven assets and a safe haven asset is an SP is an investment that is expected to retain or increase in value during times of market turbulence. Um, but if we look specifically, let's say, at um, stable coins, then um, those are defined, let's say, as being crypto today, at least, that peg their market value to an external reference uh, to offer price stability. So it's really like all about stability and what lays behind. And then it depends on what kind of stable coin you're talking about. But if we use, let's say, uh, reserve backed stablecoin, which is the one we know most about. And so then you actually peg the value um, of a of, of the currency to sort of a reserve. And so for example, uh, Paxos is, an, is, a, is a known one for gold. We have Tether, for example, to the US, US dollar. Um, and th 
the, the, the importance there is that you peg it to something, um, well, that is held in reserve. So you could even have a stable coin for the Venezuela and Bolivar, but obviously then the stable coin wouldn't be very stable, right? So um, it really depends on what you actually peg it to. You can peg it to gold, but it will follow the, um, it's follow exactly what gold will be doing. Um, if you want to peg it to dollars and you think that dollars will be more or less stable over time, eh? even though these also fluctuate, I think the dollar has um, gone up uh, or gone down actually in around 10% over the last year in terms of its value. So um, yeah, stable coins are very interesting and it's definitely something we have to look into, but they're not, not necessarily the, always the best store of value because it depends on what you actually peg it to. And maybe to add to that is you also have other kinds of stable coins. So you have collateralized stable coins and um, there they actually um, like overexpose themselves to an underlying collateral. So it's for example, saying a business owner seeks a loan eh, and he offers a property or an equipment that is 10, 20% more uh, worth than actually the money he's, bor he's borrowing. So there you, there you have another sort of other mechanism. And you also have something even more crazy, which is algorithmic stable coins that follow more like the automated expansion and contraction of what monetary supply of central banks uh, do. Um, but maybe I'm, I'm going a bit, uh, a bit into too much detail. No, that sounds great. Actually, the algorithmic. So it's just to follow up on that. How would you explain what an algorithmic backed uh, stable coin would be to my grandma Susie if she was here? <laughs> what, what exactly does it do and, and why is it something that interests you, that type of stable coin specifically? Well, I wouldn't say it interests me. Uh, it's, it's more about, OK, there are different ways of, of building such a, a stable coin. Um, and I think the most in, in, interesting thing to, to know about it is that if you think about a central bank, what it does is it, it brings money to the market, it injects money by quantitative easing uh, or by just printing new bills, but it can also re retake money from the, from, the, from the ecosystem. And normally how they do that uh, in central bank style is by buying um, less liquid assets and giving in return more liquid assets. For example, we buy very, very long-term yield bonds or something, and we um, give back pure cash. And banks can suddenly um, breathe again because they have liquidity and they can start um, giving loans again and make, make money. Um, so that's a bit what quantitative easing does. And why am I saying that? Because basically this, this back and forth of giving some money, pulling some money back, um, it's, it, it looks, that's what algorithmic stable coins look like a lot. So they, they do it automatically, uh, expand, contract the monetary supply. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. That was very interesting. Now, there's one question. Obviously, there's stable coins, as you mentioned, but also these developing countries or sorry, the countries that are hit by hyperinflation. There is what we call, of course, the DeFi, you know, earning. There's the DeFi yield farming and topics like that. And, and recently, you know, there was a really cool article released by Crypto Slate, which talks about a crypto VC giant heavily backing Wi-Fi. Right. But not just that. There's also, of course, the launch of the Uniswap token, which is also another cool article on Crypto Slate, you know, on Uniswap, helping people be able to, to transfer their funds and exchange them. What is your overall view on DeFi lending and earning for the people in those regions? Does it make sense? What is the risk reward ratio, as you talked about earlier? Uh, yeah, good question. So I think like for the for the folks who who like tuned out for a bit after the crash uh, that we used to call DeFi just open finance. Um, but now we obviously was, we're looking for new buzzwords and we said DeFi is not, 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 not a bad one. And because like, I think even back in 2019, the market cap of total DeFi tripled to $650 million. So it was still quite small and, and, and I didn't see that much going on about it. But now in 2020, it's like we're on fire with, with this and especially the last months. Um, and it starts to look so much like the ICO craze that it's super creepy. So even for, well, let's say crypto investors who are, I would say, generally speaking, uh, more risk aggressive, just because that's the way of the market. Um, this DeFi is, 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 uh, yeah, is hitting all the, all the right buttons for speculation, uh, because we've seen uh, thousands of percents of yields in one day and the, and the same 99% drops at the, uh, a day later. So it's, I think it's very creepy. Um, I think you have to really watch out what you do. So maybe let the pros handle it or uh, you see it as a casino. But um, that's obviously like what it looks like now. It's something that has to mature. For example, to give you one idea, 
about how I think about decentralization versus central centralization. They're both powers that need to exist to some extent. Yeah? Decent, pure decentralization is about I give everything to you and you take ownership of what is yours. And so let's say Engrave, my company, we offer a solution that goes to the extreme, most extreme uh, thing of decentralization, meaning we give you a hardware wallet that really empowers you to start truly owning what is yours in the sense that you no longer need anybody. You buy Bitcoin, you put it on the, on the, on the wallet and the wallet works by itself. You, have, you also have a backup in case you lose it. The backup is recoverable. And so if you contrast our super decentralized version to the centralized way of banks today, and so banks, their strategy is, okay, we are going a bit into DeFi or let's say in decentralization mode. And our strategy is more like we start from the most decentralized philosophy that, that there is. Basically, middlemen, we no longer need them. Engrave sells, sells me a device and that's it. Um, but we also obviously know that most people want to uh, outsource uh, a lot of stuff. So we will have to move back to the decentralized finance kind of world and they will move uh, a bit out of their comfort zone. Um, and I think it's the same with DeFi versus uh, CeFi. But uh, for example, you could on the normal web, you cannot buy uh, a mixer or a, or a TV without giving the site owner enough data to learn your life history. Yeah? And in, in DeFi, you can borrow money without anyone even asking who you are. Yeah? So nobody knows who you are in DeFi and you can actually do a lot of, of, of it with that. Centralized finance is the total opposite. And both have their merits. And obviously centralized finance has matured a lot as it's been around for a long time. Um, and DeFi is just coming up. So yeah, it's hot. Uh, yield farming is completely crazy. If you think that you can have 75% um, returns on one year versus an interest rate of 0%, it's, um, it's, it's a very crazy world, I would say. It's definitely a crazy world. And I love how you put the combination of CFI and DeFi working with each other, at least for the time being, right, in, in this, this specific uh, generation, because, you know, a lot of people on Twitter are actually fighting each other and saying, oh, you're a CFI, we hate you. And it's dividing us rather than, you know, keeping us together. And as you say, it's always the best of both worlds, right? Combining both to really offer something that anyone can use, because DeFi, like as you mentioned, number one, you need to be extremely technical just to set up your Mew account and connect through smart contracts and all that. Uh, but also, you know, because of gas fees, it's very exclusive, right? It's only for people who have lots of money. Yeah. So not not a good thing for people who have maybe lower incomes, less money to invest in some, you know, countries with hyperinflation or, or people who are, don't have the same privileges as, as us in the West. So um, I really like that conclusion. Very well put. Yeah, but it's, it's very exciting because I uh, some people at, uh, in my team, I saw them experimenting with uh, yield farming, for example. And so they just put some eat, for example, on, on, on such a, a wallet. And uh, they're like, yeah, I'm, all, I'm earning a euro per, uh, <laughs> per hour. Or I see it moving up per, per second. Like I'm, I'm earning money for my money being there. Uh, and it's an exaggerated uh, interest rate, let's say. And then two days later, it's like, ah, shit, uh, <laughs> it's, it went nine, minus 90%. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the name of the game in these things. So, yeah, if you want to speculate today, I think that's where you have to be. Um, otherwise, stick with Bitcoin and, and a couple of the, the ones you know have intrinsic value. Because the problem is, is with these projects is mostly which ones are now the ones that actually have merits to invest in. And that's very difficult to, uh, to gauge if you are not in it all, all, all day long, basically. Fantastic. Yeah, it definitely requires lots of time, right? To just understand which is the new pool, which one's credible, which smart contract has been audited. There's so many things, right? It requires a lot of effort. So well put, Ruben. And I want to transition to security. This is a topic that you're very, yeah. very familiar with. And uh, as we say, you know, not your keys, not your coins and, and all these things. And you just mentioned that you're trying to create or you've created, sorry, something, uh, a wallet that is as decentralized as possible but may be able to solve some of the fears that other people have when they might lose their private keys or, or might have certain issues or limitations that come from other wallets. Do you mind telling us, yep. for example, already for those who are just scared of you know, controlling their keys, how, is, how are you with Engrave solving this problem? Yeah, so we have a sort of a philosophy and basically we bring a new offering to the market that wasn't possible uh, in history, basically, until today. Um, and we call that the start truly owning what is yours uh, possibility. Um, so that's basically our tagline. And 
it might sound sounds like okay. So before I wasn't possible. It was I wasn't able to do that, and now I am. And so I, I guess I'm going to have to explain. But um, before before I start there, I think what makes even more sense is to make it even more general. So basically, going back to a simple a simple statement. For example, um, you would rather leave your house without your spouse than without your phone. So we no longer go online, we live online. And that means that we actually have all of us digital assets. And the problem with it is that none of it is ours. It's intermediaries who own it. So we have like Facebook owning your identity, we have Google owning your search history, we have banks owning your money. And even in very um, mature economies, for example, in Greece, a couple of years ago, people couldn't withdraw more than 50 euros from their banks. And so banks literally own your money. And that's where blockchain comes in. And blockchain uh, tries to eliminate these intermediaries and comes up with empowering people to own what is theirs. And the promise is really beautiful. Eh? But if we look at the reality, exchanges, they own your private keys and they just give you a password to log into their platforms. So again, you own uh, a password that gives you the right to request an action. Can I do something with the Bitcoin you have there? But you never own these Bitcoin. Hot wallets, um, so online wallets, the same issue. You um, make your keys online, meaning that they are probably being watched by a potential hacker. And so you cannot own what is yours in that, in that sense. And hardware wallets, the most secure option that is uh, available today, it is, um, it is interesting to see how far they can go, but you immediately see the limitations. And I think the most beautiful ex examples are where do you start owning what is yours? Well, you need your private key. Eh? Your private key is your access key to your crypto wallet. And all the, uh, most of the wallets I've seen at least, um, they just give you a key. So this, they say, this is your wallet. Look, here, here is it. It's written, write it down on a piece of paper. So if you lose this wallet, you take a new one, you can recover your, your, your accounts. But so because the simple fact that it is there, it means that there might be, um, they might have a database of all the keys they ever made. And at some point, they do an exit scam. And the second thing that's important there is that there are proven backdoors in the key generation processes. So the thing creates a key. And even if, let's say, your manufacturer of the hardware wallet is completely um, legit, the, there might be intelligence agencies that know how to gener regenerate your key. And you can, you can look that up on the internet and you can find a lot of articles on that. But so... Even in hardware wallets today, the most secure solution that comes closest to decentralizing your wealth, eh, um, it is impossible to start truly owning what is yours. So that's why at that point we, we said, okay, how do we enable it? We have to enable it by building a solution that is 100% offline. So you create it in a setting where there is nobody else. And um, so our hardware wallet is in, it does it in an interaction. So there's a real-time interaction with you and the hardware wallets to create your key. And it takes, let's say, part of your biometrics. It takes random inputs that are really surrounding you in the moment you're making it, not just the chip inside the device itself. And it also lets you interact with the key in a very, very smart way that you cannot be doing human mistakes because humans are predictable, but um, also, but also actually making sure that you're the only person who has ever seen the key and even the manufacturer and grave has no idea of what the key is. And so that simple thing, which is just the beginning, that's how you start with doing what we actually promise you. But it goes end to end. So it's only, uh, you really have to think about all the steps that come after up until the point that you pass away, your kids need access to their Bitcoin, uh, to your Bitcoin. Um, and if you think about the existing solutions, you have a hardware wallet, you have a piece of paper, if you lose the piece of paper, it's game over. Uh, we actually developed a whole full-fledged end-to-end suite so that you can always um, have a backup in some way and nobody will know your key, not even us, any point in time. And that sounds very abstract like this, I know, but uh, uh, obviously there are websites you can go to, to to understand that better. That's really exciting. Is that kind of like the future of where these um, hardware wallets are going to be like having biometrics? So something like, let's say I lose my mm. private key, but there's a facial recognition, there's iris recognition, fingerprint recognition, something that could help me in some way get access to my private keys in case I lose them and, and for user friendliness and stuff like that? Yeah, so um, there, there it depends a bit. Huh? So I would say the future should be 
One where security is a hygiene factor. Right? Today, security isn't a hygiene factor. Th that's easily proven. Look at all the hacks. 2019, it was a record year, 4.5 billion US dollars were stolen. Uh, this year, we're seeing th the same trend. And um, what, what hardware wallets need to do, or what the whole industry needs to do, is get to a point where nobody cares about security anymore. Think about your bank. You would rather switch from the one to the other because you like the color more and the branding. But there are not really a lot of other reasons to, to switch, and especially not security. Um, so what we've done is we have built an offline hardware wallet, yeah, the Zero. It's right here. Yeah? And it can um, create your keys offline. It can sign transactions offline. It will never connect to the internet. So it is completely um, immune to any kind of online attacker because nobody can attack it. There is no line of attack possible. It is also built from scratch to be tamper-proof, so physical attacks are also not possible. And to prove the, uh, to, to really prove that it's so secure, we certified it for EL7, which is the highest security certification in the world. And it is the only product in the whole digital asset space, so even beyond blockchain, it has this level of certification. Our closest competitor has five out of seven on uh, one component, and. Um, I'm saying that because we believe security is extremely important, but at the same time, it's a it needs to become a hygiene factor. So now we have done that. For us, we're like, okay, that's security. And now it's all about user, user experience. Right? So our device is a touchscreen device. It's super simple. You swipe, you, you just select the coin you want, and they're immediately in your wallet. So you don't even recognize or, or, or notice that there is cryptography in the back. You just do what you want to do. I want to have Bitcoin. I want to do a Bitcoin transaction. Everything is super smooth. And I think the, the um, innovation is more on the side of improving the user experience, um, improving the overall product and brand experience, and thinking about what people want to do. Um, so for example, staking is something that uh, people find very important. Um, there are coming new um, post-quantum cryptography algorithms as we speak. Yeah? So NIST uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, eh? um, that, that basically, um, let's say, brought the first uh, advanced encryption standards for the whole world uh, into existence. Eh? And it's still used in um, WhatsApp to encrypt messages or in Telegram to encrypt messages. By the way, this uh, algorithm was invented by people that are in, working in our company. Um, today, in the last four years, they have actually been working on the post-quantum cryptography standard. And our team is, again, uh, one of the finalists in that. So they basically announced the final lists uh, one month ago. And now we're going towards these new algorithms. And it will also be important to integrate those, obviously, in a hardware wallet, so that you can also support all of these new blockchains that will come with new and, and more advanced cryptography. Um, yeah, but I, I don't want to go too far because I have a lot of ideas on the <laughs> The future of hardware wallets. That's fantastic. I mean, it's already lots to think about, and you know, hopefully, reassure those people who are afraid to actually, you know, hold their cryptos. And it seems like you guys at Engraver are really building a quality product with a solution that can help, you know, the mass in general, right? And not be too technical and have to have a PhD in order to understand how to store your cryptos. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, Ruben, if we want to follow more, I know Engrave, you, you are active on Twitter. You're active on LinkedIn. I know Engrave is quite active on Twitter as well. Where, where are the best places to find more information about Engrave and yourself? Well, Engrave, it's the website and it's really all the social media. So if you look for Engrave, you'll find it. If you look for Ruben Mera, that's my name, you will find me as well. So it's, it's very straightforward. Fantastic. And we'll put the links in the description box below and in the pinned comments so that you can get more information. Ruben, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. We talked about some really cool topics such as DeFi versus CeFi, yield farming, countries facing hyperinflation, inflation within Western countries as well. And of course, security, how to store your cryptos in an easy and safe way with Engrave. Thank you so much, Ruben. And guys, don't forget to tune in every week, Wednesday, 8 o'clock BST. Like, comment, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so that you can get access to all these timeless interviews, guys. Thank you so much for watching and see you next week.